This is Chemical Processes for Micro and Nanofabrication. I'm Chris Mack, your professor for this course, and this is Lecture 19 on Rapid Thermal Processing. Our reading, Chapter 6 of our textbook by Campbell. Last time we talked about ion implantation and the idea of using uh, annealing to activate the dopants. Sometimes this implant, followed by anneal, is intended to create shallow junctions, that is, junctions where the junction depth into the wafer is relatively small. What do we mean by small? Well, today we need junctions as low as 20 nanometers. Um, uh, 20 to 50 is generally what we call a shallow uh, junction today. And these junctions require low diffusion lengths. We can implant in the 20 to 50 nanometer range, but once we activate the dopants, the actual junction depth will be a function of how far in to the wafer we've implanted, plus how far the dopants have diffused. Uh, that means our diffusion has to be small. The diffusion length has to be small. It also means it has to be well controlled, because 20 plus or minus 2 nanometers, well that's 10 percent, versus uh, 200 nanometers plus or minus 2 nanometers, that's only 1 percent variation. So a, sh a, a shallow junction means the diffusion lengths have to be very, very well controlled. Why do we need shallow junctions? Well, this goes all the way back to Denard scaling. When we shrink a transistor, we have to shrink everything. The widths, but also the heights, the, the z dimensions, the depths, and that means the junction depths as well. So we need small diffusion lengths that are well controlled. How do we achieve this? The problem is, when we anneal at a high temperature to get the dopant activated and to get the defect densities in the crystal to be very low, so there's no voids, point defects, slip defects, plane defects, etc., um, errors in the crystal structure, we need high temperatures. And but to achieve a short diffusion length, we need to have low temperatures. Well, you can't have both. So how are we going to accomplish this? Well, that means we have to have a high temperature for a short time. Uh, diffusion length is the square root of the diffusivity times the time. The diffusivity is temperature dependent. In fact, it's exponential with temperature, right? Depending on the activation energy. Uh, we get much higher diffusion lengths at high temperature. So if we use a high temperature, in order to keep our diffusion length short, that means we're going to have to have a short time. Short time means two things. One, we have to ramp to our temperature very quickly, because that's part of the time when we're ramping as well. And then we have to keep it at that temperature for a short time, and then we have to cool it off or quench the, the bake very quickly as well. Uh, so the only possible way to achieve a short diffusion length at the same time as having a very high temperature is to make the time of that, that we're at that temperature very, very short. How do we do that? Well, we can't do it in a furnace. Right? Furnaces take tens of minutes to hours to go through a cycle uh, up to a high temperature. You just can't do it quickly. Instead, we use a technology called rapid thermal processing. Here's a kind of a prototype diagram of a rapid thermal processing system. Uh, we use a bank of lamps to use optical energy to rapidly heat one wafer at a time. Remember the furnaces, we, we put in 25 to 100 wafers in one furnace uh, because it's a long process. We want to do as many as we can at once, but here we're doing very short processes we can afford to do one wafer at a time. So we take our wafer, we put it in a chamber, we put it on some very low mass pins. All right, why do we want the pin low mass? Well we want to heat the wafer but we don't want the heat to drain off through conduction of some uh, metal pin that conducts the heat away. Uh, so we want a very small pin that won't conduct much heat away, it won't influence the temperature of the wafer in this region. So one wafer sits on these small pins. We put it in a chamber with some quartz windows here and here. And then we use lamps, very, very bright lamps that heat up the wafer optically, heat lamps. And 
we, we put so much energy that it can ramp to a high temperature very, very quickly. We measure the temperature in real time for control using a pyrometer. I'll talk about that later. And one feature of this system is that the chamber that it's sitting in is cold walled. That is, we're not heating up the chamber, we're only heating up the wafer. We'll see a little bit more how that works in a minute. So, let's think about all the pieces of a rapid thermal processing step uh, system. First, we're doing radiative heating, optical energy. We can supply the optical energy on the front side with lamps above the wafer, or on the back side, lamps below the wafer, or both, depending on what we're trying to do. We want to be able to use these systems over a range of processes. Sometimes there's a need for low temperature short bakes. Sometimes the need, there's a need for high temperature short breaks, uh, bakes. We have systems out in the marketplace today that have te temperature set points going from 150 to 1300 degrees centigrade. We need to ramp quickly to the, the set point of the high temperature, the peak temperature. The ramp rates today can exceed 200 degrees centigrade per second. That's pretty fast ramp. Imagine going up to um, 1,000 degrees in just five seconds. We can control the time that it is at the highest temperature today to be less than a second. Typical short anneals are, are on the one to two second regime, but it is possible to go even shorter than a second. This gives us a wide range of time temperature options. We can, of course, keep that in for longer and have a longer temperature of time if we'd like. Uh, so we have this huge range of temperatures. We have a wide range of times, including very short times, and that allows us to choose between competing reactions. Again, think about uh, D times T for example. Uh, diffusivity times time. Diffusivity has a certain activation energy. That is, the diffusivity varies with temperature in a certain way. Um, reactions have rate constants which vary with temperature in usually a different way, as a different activation energy. As a result, you can choose which mechanism or which reaction is dominant by adjusting the temperature. So at low temperatures, for example, one rate constant might be larger than a second, but because they have different activation energies, you go to a high temperature, it might flip, and, and the other rate constant, in fact, is the bigger one, because it had the higher activation energy. Uh, so having this wide range of time and temperature options allows us to uh, emphasize one reaction without another. So for example, uh, we can have a fast recrystallization of the silicon wafer, wafer after ion implantation, but with a very low amount of diffusion by using a high temperature because the recrystallization process has a higher activation energy than diffusion. We also have to have a fast cooling. We have to control the whole cycle. While it's cooling, it's still reacting or it's still diffusing. So you have to cool it down quickly as well. And it's important to remember that these are such fast processes that there's no equilibrium being established. They're completely non-equilibrium processes. Uh, this is, uh, makes it very difficult to model what's going to happen, um, but it also means uh, we can do some interesting things like dope at higher than the, s the solid solubility of the dopant in silicon because it's not an equilibrium. We can have super saturated uh, dopants in the silicon. Some other aspects of rapid thermal processing. Temperature uniformity is very difficult. Um, we want uniformity across the wafer and then from wafer to wafer. It's a circular wafer, so we we'll, might use radial heating lamps. Um, and we'll use a chamber that is reflective. I mentioned that the chamber is cold-walled. Well, one of the reasons it's cold-walled is, it, is it reflects the light energy and it doesn't absorb it. If it reflects it, it doesn't heat up. So 
uh, we can use the reflections off of the chamber to help make the light more uniform as it uh, exposes the wafer. The edges of the wafer radiate heat out. So the top and the bottom radiate heat out, but only around the edge of the wafer do we have this extra surface that radiates. And so as a result, the edges will be cooler. Uh, the part of the wafer near the outside will end up being cooler than the middle because it has that extra mechanism of radiating heat out. So we use an edge ring. We, we put a structure very close to the edge to help reflect that light back in, that heat back in and, and heat up. We also use these radial heating lamps where we can put a little bit more energy on the outside compared to the middle to try to even out the temperature. But we also have some problems uh, with something called the pattern loading effect. Uh, and we'll talk more about the mechanism of heating shortly, but basically some parts of the wafer have material on it that absorbs a lot of the light, and another part of the wafer might have material on it, an oxide or uh, a metal, that, that either transmits or reflects the light, and as a result doesn't heat up as much. So we get some variations across the wafer depending on the patterns that are on the wafer themselves. Uh, that can result in some fairly large variations of temperature across the wafer. It takes a lot of work, but we can get it down to, say, 3 degree variation uh, across the entire die, a uh, single chip being made. <coughs> well, intrinsic to the ability to control temperature is the ability to measure temperature. There are several different ways of measuring temperature, but one of the key keys to this application is we have to be able to measure the temperature quickly. It's a very fast process, and a, a measurement system that takes a long time to work, well, it's just not going to work. We have to measure uh, temperatures with very short time constants. Uh, the preferred me method is optical pyrometry. Here we measure the intensity of light that's being emitted from the wafer. It's kind of like uh, using a camera to look at a, a red hot uh, piece of metal. Uh, the, the color of the light coming off the wafer is a measure of how hot it is. And so by measuring the intensity of light over a function of wavelength, we can get some information about how hot that wafer is. Um, this is still a, a difficult problem, uh, the emissivity, the, the way in which uh, the wafer radiates out, is a function of the materials on the wafer. And those materials are varying because some parts of the wafer have metal on it, some parts have oxide, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, we're going to get variations in the emissivity across the wafer. That's going to make calibration difficult. And uh, as a result, absolute temperatures are almost never known. We're, we're kind of doing relative measures. So if we get every wafer to be consistent, even if we don't know exactly what the temperature is, we at least know we're at the point we want to be at. Um, there are other temperature measurement methods as well. There's acoustic temperature measurement. You might think about that. Wow, how do you measure the temperature acoustically? Well, the speed of sound. The speed of sound in the atmosphere is a function of the temperature. And so if you, uh, the speed of sound through a wafer is a function of the temperature. So uh, we can measure the, how, how sound moves through the wafer, and that's a measure of how hot the wafer is. We've kind of hinted at a few items uh, about radiative heat transfer, but let me go into just a little bit more detail. There's three basic mechanisms of heat flow, uh, Q dot, the time variation in the quantity of heat, we call the flow of heat, the heat flow. Uh, we have radiative, conductive, and convective mechanisms of heat flow. Down here, conduction, the heat flow is some uh, constant times the gradient in the temperature. This del operator is dt dx in one dimension. And k is the thermal conductivity of the material. Metals have high thermal conductivity. Insulators have low thermal conductivity, etc. Convection. Uh, has a, a thermal transfer coefficient, h, 
and it's a function of the, the overall temperature difference, the difference between the temperature of, say, the wafer and the environment a long ways away, or the infinite uh, uh, temperature, infinity temperature. Uh, those are very common and standard modes of transferring heat from one place to another. But radiative heat transfer is also important. Obviously, we get, get a lot of heat from the sun on our planet. That's a radiative heat transfer process. If you ever sit next to the fire, uh, you know that just putting a thin piece of paper between you and the fire can make your face a lot less hot uh, because of the radiative transfer of heat, uh, as well as the convection transfer of heat through the air. The radiative thermal transfer is governed by the Stefan, Stefan, Boltz, Stefan Boltzmann equation, if I can say it right. The Stefan Boltzmann equation says the heat flow is proportional to the temperature to the fourth power. Uh, there's also the Stefan Boltzmann constant sigma, which has a specific value, and then something called the emissivity of the material. Uh, I, I mentioned this uh, a little bit ago. I'll talk a little bit more about what that is, but it's a material dependent parameter. It's also a wavelength dependent parameter. It has a maximum value of one. If the emissivity is one, we call that a black body. It absorbs all energy, radiative energy that strikes it. So if we have a very high temperature, because uh, the heat flow goes as the temperature to the fourth power. Here it goes as the gradient or the difference in the temperature. Uh, as the temperature gets very high, the, the radiative heat flow increases in magnitude faster than the convection and convection heat flow will increase. As a result, we become dominated by, high, by radiative power transfer mechanisms whenever we're at very high temperatures. That's irritating. Okay, Outlook wanted to talk to me there. So, um, absorption by the wafer. This is how we think about emissivity. You know, what can happen to light when it hits the wafer? Some of it might be reflected. This is the reflection coefficient R, uh, 0 to 100% to light being reflected. Some of the light might be transmitted. And whatever light is not transmitted must be absorbed. So the reflection plus the transmission plus the absorption all adds up to one, the total amount of light that there is. So the absorption, uh, we can think of as one minus the reflection minus the transmission. Well, for silicon at the wavelengths that we're using, the optical wavelengths we're using to expose and heat up with our lamps, it essentially has zero transmission. No light transmits through. Well, that's not true, of course, at every wavelength. In visible light, you can't see through a wafer, so it must have a transmission that's low. But in infrared, uh, you can actually show that silicon would make a good mirror at long enough wavelengths. But at the wavelengths we're using, it's opaque. Uh, it doesn't transmit any light. So it's either reflected or absorbed. And uh, at the wavelengths that we're using, about 30% of the light will be reflected off of a silicon wafer, and about 70% will be absorbed. Now that's for silicon. Other materials are different. Say a metal is going to reflect more light and absorb less. Silicon dioxide will transmit, but of course under the silicon dioxide is some silicon somewhere, and that will absorb. Um, but this emissivity is a function of the material. And that's why we get variations in the emissivity across the wafer when we start to pattern uh, our wafer and start to build our transistors. The heating options are basically front side and back side. Uh, here are examples uh, that I got from applied materials showing uh, two options. Uh, you might notice over here the lamps are in a honeycomb arrangement. Um, so each one of these circles here is an individual heating element, a heating lamp. And because of that, they can uh, adjust the power of the outside elements differently than the middle to account for uh, radiative heat loss at the edges. But look at the top of this wafer. This is a wafer that's been patterned. It's got lots of chips on it with lots of uh, features. You can see the colors are different. That means they reflect light differently in different po points or portions of that wafer. So if I were to put a lamp on the top, I'm going to get a variation in the reflectivity across the top. 
So in this backside heating method, we know that the backside is just blank. It all absorbs light at about the same rate. Uh, here's an example with the front side heating, where again we have all these lamps arranged in a honeycomb pattern, and so we can uh, uh, again adjust the, the lamps accordingly to get the maximum uniformity across the wafer. What do we use rapid thermal processing for? Well, the first example we've already talked about is rapid thermal annealing, or RTA. We, we need this to get shallow junctions. But we also use rapid thermal processing for very thin oxides. If we want a very thin oxide, we can do it in the furnace with dry O2. But if the oxidation rate is too high, then it takes we, we can't control the oxide uh, to create a thin enough uh, layer because the rate of oxidation is too fast unless we use a very, very short time. And that's what rapid thermal oxidation will do for us. Dry O2, thin oxides, um, we can do that well in an RTO system. Rapid thermal nitrida nitridation, creating silicon nitride. Um, silicon oxynitrides as well. We create silicides or silicides. A silicide would be a metal reacting with silicon. So we coat the, the surface with silicon and then we heat it up and we get a reaction between the metal and the silicon, like titanium silicide or nickel silicide, cobalt silicide. Uh, and that um, silicide results in a better contact resistance between the metal and the silicon. So we use it for contacts. The word salicide is kind of a mat not a chemistry word, it's a semiconductor word. We made up it's self-aligned silicide. So it's a silicide, that's the chemistry. Salicide means we've self-aligned the position of that material relative to the contact hole. And finally, uh, we sometimes put down a dielectric in a separate process, but then uh, we want to densify it. So we use a th high temperature thermal process to densify the oxide to get a little bit better electrical properties for uh, the gate oxide, high K. Uh, gate K is the relative dielectric constant. So high K means it has a high dielectric constant. And the denser films have the higher dielectric constants, which are advantageous for the proper operation of an MOS transistor that's been scaled to be very, very small. So another way of thinking about uh, this process, um, and I'll, I'll use the context of rapid thermal annealing, is to think about how fast and how long we want um, the process to occur in. Uh, these RTP systems work over a range of temperature ramps. Um, so for example, we have some older systems or cheaper systems, less expensive, I should say, uh, equipment that the ramp time is under 100 degrees C per second. So I guess I, I, I left off the per second here in the table, but that's 100 degrees C per second ramp time. And then we'll do a soak. That is, we'll, we'll let it stay at that temperature for a long time. What's a long time? In the world of rapid thermal processing, uh, bigger than five seconds. So 10, 20 seconds, we let it soak at the high temperature. Not a long soak compared to uh, 12 hours in a furnace, but for an RTP system, it's long. Contrast that with a spike RTP. Here we're going to ramp it up at more like 200 degrees C per second. We'll let it stay at the highest temperature for less than two seconds, maybe even less than one second. And it just quickly spikes at the temperature and then cools back down. So what are the pros and cons of, of these two different types of processes? Well, the soak RTP um, has reasonable thermal control without the the very, very fast ramp, we have less stress occurring on the, on the wafer. Um, these stresses, when you uh, heat it rapidly, can be uh, very difficult to, difficult to control, especially uh, you have to worry about the uniformity. So the result is simpler equipment. You don't have to worry as much about uniformity. It's much easier to control the thermal budget. Um, but the problem is with the, the longer times, you get bigger DT. Uh, that is the diffusion length. You have a larger thermal budget, and that's a problem. 
In contrast, if we use the spike RTB method, we can have reduced transient enhanced diffusion. Remember that from our discussion of ion implantation. We can have reduced thermal budget, that is uh, diffusivity times time. This is supposed to be a, a small t here. Uh, apologize for that. dt, just like over here. Uh, the diffusion length is uh, supposed to be smaller, uh, will be smaller with the spike RTP, but the higher peak temperature is harder to control and measure. And that makes uh, the process equipment uh, more complicated and overall the system more expensive. So we use the spike only if we need it. If we can get by with the soak, it's going to be easier and cheaper. So let's review what we have learned. You should be able to easily answer these questions. If not, go back and re review the material. Why are shallow junctions needed today? And why are they hard to make? You should be able to describe the basic components of an RTP system. How is heating accomplished in an RTP system? And what is... Uh, the method of measuring temperature in these systems. And finally, what is RTP used for? What are the different process steps in CMOS manufacturing where RTP is important? Well, that's our lecture. Next, we're going to begin a long series of lectures on various ways of depositing materials on our wafers, the topic of deposition. Till then.